I just wanted to let everyone know that this session is being recorded and welcome you all to the Federal Leadership and Professional Development Seminar Series on Individual and Organizational Networks, How Your Networks Drive Career and Organizational Success. And the presenter will be Dylan uh, Morosik McDonald, and he's coming to us uh, from the National Park Service. Next slide. So the sponsors for today's event is uh, Arc Magic, who is sponsoring the event day logistics and support. Siobhan Walker is monitoring the chat lines for us. And GSI Digital Gov University, um, Gabby, is, is monitoring the webinar platform and providing the webinar platform so you all can join today. So thank you all very much for that. Just a quick disclaimer on the next slide. Uh, unless otherwise noted, no statement in the seminar should be construed as an official position of any federal agency. Next slide, please. So just a quick uh, summary of the Federal Leadership and Professional Development Seminar Series for folks that are new to the seminar series. It's a bi-government and for-government seminar series covering leadership and professional development topics and best practices. So the overview, uh, next slide. Uh, we started in September of 2017, and uh, we have speakers from across the government, most are SES and, and in other leadership roles. And the audience also is open to any uh, federal employee and the attendees come from all levels. For today, we have GS1 um, through SES attending. Uh, attendees are usually coming in person or remote, but uh, for uh, today, during the special circumstance, we're all remote. Our frequency is every couple of months. Uh, there's no funding for the series. There's no cost to attendees and no payment for speakers. Next slide. So the, the seminar goals are connection, sharing, professional development, problem solving, access, partnership, and promotion. And the next slide, our uh, seminar series vision is to build, retain, and connect a more collaborative, engaged, and a capable workforce with the tools and expertise needed to more efficiently and effectively serve the, pub the public and ultimately go further, faster together. So the next slide just shows a bit on our reach. We have 12 seminars posted on our YouTube channel six on max.gov. Our listserv subscribers are over uh, 4,500 folks from across the government. Our attendees range from 350 to 1,500 per seminar, and our uh, agencies attending per seminar ranges between 40 and 60. And the next slide shows you the agencies attending today. So we have uh, folks attending from 51 agencies across the government. I'm just going to leave this up for a second. Just to show all the folks who are um, online and on the phone today, uh, it's really great to see everyone connected, especially in a time like this where it's, it's harder to connect. And progressing on just a bit of information for folks who uh, are new to the series, uh, my contact information, if you haven't signed up for the listserv and would like a future announcement, the link is here and it's uh, in the slides that I shared as well. And then links to past seminar recordings are here as well. So the next seminars that are coming up, there is one coming up on uh, resiliency, uh, coming up in June or July, and then our workshop on organizational culture and culture change is coming up on, uh, right now it's a pending date of uh, August 14th. Our seminar action teams, uh, we've been talking about those for a while, and thanks for everyone who's offered to uh, volunteer for various things such as topic development, uh, section 508 formatting, video formatting. Uh, working on the communities of practice and communication and dissemination. And apologies for the delay on this, because I had hoped to start this at the beginning of the year, but I have actually had a, a family emergency that I've mentioned to some when, when they've asked about when are the, the teams starting up. And actually, I just wanted to do um, a quick uh, special dedication to my, my father, who actually had passed away on April 20th and after a long battle with cancer. And I just wanted to say uh, his support and encouragement definitely helped start this whole series out uh, when I when it started with a small idea, and, um, and so I just wanted to give a special dedication to him at the start. So today's speaker, coming from National Park Service, uh, Dylan Morosik McDonald, began his federal career as a ranger, and he currently serves as the acting head of the Office of uh, Re Relevancy, Diversity, and Inclusion for National Park Service. He's a summa cum laude, a graduate of Vermont Law School's top-ranked program in law and policy, and he holds a specialization in design thinking for innovation from the University of Virginia Darden School and is a master's candidate in human relations and positive organization development. He's a senior fellow with the Environmental Leadership Program, and he serves as a guest lecturer at MIT Sloan School of Business and the University of Colorado Center on Network Science, instructing on human dynamics and networks, leadership, 
and teamwork and collaboration. So please um, join me in welcoming Dylan. And we can't clap since we're not in person, but I'm going to hand it over to him. And if he's not here, then I will end up uh, sharing the slide deck uh, for, for his slides as well. Just want to check in to see. Dylan, are you on the phone? I am, yeah. And I'm back in Adobe, and I can try sharing. Hopefully, it will work this time. Okay. Thanks, Kim. All right, great. Give me one moment while I get this up. Great, we can see your slides now. <laughs> All right, perfect. Great, thank you. All right, thank you, Kim, for that introduction, and thanks, everyone, for uh, for joining us all today. Um, before we start um, and, and get into the goals and, and learning objectives, I just want to uh, I want to thank everyone and, and recognize everyone. Um, it is uh, Public Service Recognition Week this week, uh, and I just I want to make sure we take a moment to acknowledge uh, the service uh, that that each one of us offers uh, to the American public every day in the course of our work. Um, <clears throat> one, of the best, one of the best definitions of service that, that I remember hearing is a, a contribution to the welfare of others. And I think that just so perfectly succinctly summarizes um, public service and government service. So just want to give everyone a, a shout out and a recognition before we, before we get any further along today. So um, a few things about what you know, the goals for today's session are. Um, really want to just you know understand what a network is first and foremost. Uh, it's a term that's everywhere nowadays, right? Um, and it can mean a lot of different things depending upon the context. So really just define that better as far as what we're talking about today. We'd, uh, we want to understand why networks are important, right? We're all taking time out of our day to be here. Um, so hopefully we can just, we can have a discussion and a conversation about you know specifically why this is an important topic and why it deserves attention. Um, and intention uh, from all of us in the course of our work. Uh, and then finally, become more intentional and strategic um, within our own networks. And we're going to talk about all of these throughout the course of the day, so I won't spend much time here. Uh, Kim already gave the disclaimer. Uh, just want to reiterate that here. And I want to welcome you all and, uh, and just do a quick check-in here. So I know you all introduced each other um, briefly at the start, but uh, just to 30 seconds here, maybe a minute, and I've got a few uh, a few questions here on the screen, and we'll invite you to uh, to pick one of these three, uh, whichever one you like. Um, it could be more than one if you want, and uh, and just go ahead and and uh, and just offer a, you know a, a couple words or a couple lines in the chat, um, just uh, just to share with with your colleagues today, and I'll I'll be quiet for about 30 seconds or so while you do that. Hey Dylan, and while um, while some folks are saying that they're having a hard time hearing you, it might be folks' speaker volume. Um, but if you can, just check and confirm that your your phone speaker is all the way up, if possible. Thanks. So Thanks. Much. Yep, I just I just saw that. Yeah, and I just I just re reinstalled my headset. So hopefully, hopefully, if there were any issues on my end, that should that should take care of it. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much. Great. All right, so folks are folks are chatting in some of their uh, some of their answers to some of these questions. So it looks like um, folks are talking about uh, some places uh, furthest away from home. We have Italy, uh, Isle of Tiger. I'm assuming that's going to be the uh, the professional wrestler introduction and entrance song, which is great. Uh, and then some uh, some silliest fears from childhood, dark clowns. Yep, great, good, excellent. So you can uh, you know folks can finish finish chatting those in if, if you haven't done so already. Um, basically, you know I want to I want to try to keep this engaging. Um, I, you know recognizing that this is an all virtual format, so which which can be challenging, particularly with this many folks on the line. Um, so. 
you know, wanted to ask some of these questions because they, they provide an opportunity to, for us to, to share some, some small pieces of ourselves uh, besides just our, our name and our title and our agency, right? So the first question is just kind of fun, right? What songs and music really get you going? Um, the second question isn't one that really has to be answered literally. It's actually, I, I like this question because it's, it's really open to interpretation, right? Um, for example, what is home? You know, someone may ask, um, and that's going to depend upon you know your your particular um, your particular perspective, right? Um, if you think about the context of the question, you know, how do you find home, and then how do you choose to interpret distance, right? So, just interesting to see how people interpret questions like this. And then, and then for the third question, you know, we we really humans uh, aren't designed to be rational, and sometimes we just need to be reminded that um, people around us are human too. Um, you could, you know, some people take this as an opportunity to really be vulnerable and open up, um, which is great. You know, as we all know, and, and something that's important to networks uh, as we grow up is we realize that, you know, being different when we're young uh, is, is rarely a good thing, right? It's a very real fear that many of us harbor, but as adults, being different is what makes us who we are, uh, what makes life interesting, and, and what makes us successful ultimately. So, so answering these questions, you know, I just ask these because. I want us, you know, I want us to be able to connect a little bit to one another. Um, they help to build trust uh, and they help to share our experiences, you know, among each other. Factors, all factors that we're going to be touching on today and exploring um, in our discussion of networks. So, a quick agenda for today. Um, we're going to we're going to talk about what a network is. Uh, we're going to talk about organizational networks specifically. Um, how how an understanding of networks can benefit um, organizations. Uh, on, on that scale, and then we're going to zoom in and we're going to look at personal networks. And I'll offer right here at the start that when I say organizational and personal, they're really different lenses or different frames that we can take uh, for, for, viewing, um, for viewing our networks. So don't think of them as either or. Um, they're, really just, they're really just ways we can, we can understand what they are. So, let me ask you another question. Um, what is a network, right? When I say network, what are some things that what are some things that, that spring to mind quickly? And I'm loving scrolling back through here and reading some of the uh, some of the responses. Thanks everyone for for for, uh, for offering. People are connected. Connections between people. Okay, relationships. A lot of relationships. Just things. That, Connections, communications, um, connecting and communicating, opportunities to learn relationships, social networks. Good, great. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Thank you all. Um, yeah, network is one of those terms. It's it's literally everywhere nowadays. Um, I've been I've been at home as I'm sure many of us have been for the last month or so. And I have young kids, and we were uh, we were baking cookies the other day, and I don't often bake cookies, and because I'm kind of an analytical person, as I was reading the directions, it talked about creaming the butter and sugar, so I had to Google creaming to figure out, okay, what, how exactly do I do this to make these cookies turn out right? Um, and sure enough, there in the description of how to cream um, butter and sugar was actually, they were actually talking about the network of air bubbles and the leavening agents. And uh, so literally, it's a term that, that you see everywhere nowadays, particularly um, particularly in social networks and internet, you know, the rise of social media. Um, but a network can really describe anything in any relationship. Um, you know, electrical networks, um, hospital networks, transportation networks, uh, obviously computer networks. Uh, and then of course, the, the lens we're gonna be taking today, as, as many of you have, have highlighted here, is the social the aspect of social networks and, and interpersonal networks and connectivity. So for our purposes today, um, we're going to define a network as the connections and patterns of relationships that exist between people. So this recognizes, and you can substitute, you know, those parameters for anything, right? We can talk about the network and connections uh, that exist, you know, between, um, you know, in an electrical grid, right, or between hospitals and, and medical providers. Um, it really just de depends on how you want to define it. So for today, we're going to talk about people. Um, and one of the best ways, uh, one of the, the, the best quotes that I think of when I think of networks uh, in, in this way is, is uh, this quote by Rumi, and that is, you think because you understand one, you must also understand two, because one and one make two. 
but you must also understand and. And that really is the key to networks, right? Right there, succinctly summarized, is, is it, you know, it's not just the technical pieces, it's really the, the connectivity piece and it's understanding those, those little, little idiosyncrasies. I'll give you another just another quick example here when we talk about networks and this you know relevant one okay. all around us nowadays is obviously the COVID nineteen situation um, and and network science which is which is the study of networks um, is is really at the forefront of everything that we're doing every day um, you know we're all applying these principles in in all aspects of how we're navigating this this new complex life that. That we're living, right? Um, how, you know, how can we, can we? Who's connecting to whom? Um, can we limit our time and contact when we're in large groups? Where are the hubs of activity? You know, those hot spots. Um, what forms might the virus spread in those central areas? You know, where are the connectors who transmit? Uh, how frequently do I wear a mask? Wash my hands? These are all be because the common uh, denominator is human contact in a pandemic, it, it is the perfect sort of lens to look at networks. And if we just look at one element of that, which is contact tracing, um, you know, at a fundamental level, that's really a form of mapping a network, right? It's, it's looking at who connected with who, when, um, you know, what type of interaction did they have? It's looking at all those um, variables that are, um, that are really so important in this, um, and that's that's the last I'm I'm really going to speak of, of that today because I know we're probably we're all kind of on burnout factor at, uh, with with the COVID situation, but um, I think it's worth mentioning here because network epidemiology is is really at the forefront of informing policy and response to to this pandemic, and there's a lot of really um, phenomenal people out there doing doing great work. So let's. Uh, so as I said, we're going to we're going to sort of take two lenses today, examining networks. The first is going to be an organizational lens, um, and this is a this is a great quote that uh, that I really love from Douglas McGregor. And if you haven't read his book, I'm sure many of you have. Um, it's a phenomenal read, well worth it. Um, but even as far back as 1960, and I can assure you, it's still a very relevant read today. It's um, it is uh, it's it's just sort of prescient in how he defines um, you know this this organizational structure that he talks about um, and obviously you know hierarchies and bureaucracies are not going anywhere <laughs> at least not right now um, so we're not talking about throwing throwing out the old and coming with the new but like I said it's just a different lens that we can take to examine these um, these systems and these factors so before we get to, to networks within organizations, it's worth mentioning just very briefly, and we're not going to spend a lot of time here because this is not really a, uh, a change change management seminar. But you know, we, we talk about the evolution of organizations because organizations, as we know them today, have developed and grown into what they are over the course of history, um, and each each era has brought with it uh, new challenges, new innovations, um, new markets. Um, and that fundamentally um, that fundamentally influences uh, the evolution of how we how we connect within organizations. Um, government is a little different, obviously. This chart comes from Miles and Creed, who, who are looking a little bit more at the private sector. Um, and we don't, you know, you don't need to dive in depth here. Um, I know a couple of you in the chat have been asking for the, sh the slides, and, and um, we'll definitely share those with everyone who needs them, who hasn't got them yet, so you can explore these in more, in more depth on your own. I don't really want to dive through them in great depth. I just want to sort of introduce this concept that organizations do grow and they do evolve. Another lens that, that we can take to look at that um, is a, a more recent example um, from Frederick Lulu of a few years back now. He talks about the evolution of organizations as a organizational consciousness, you know, um, whereby with each change in, in the, in the uh, the context of an organization, you have you have innovations and breakthroughs um, that take place that that alter um, how an organization functions and what what the sort of um, what the guiding uh, principles are. Um, so and again, I'm not going to really dive into this chart in great depth. Um, he actually even adds another level on here that he calls teal, um, but. So again, you know, I'll leave that up to you guys uh, to explore in more depth if you're interested. Um, I see a couple 
folks recommending Ruby's book in the chat. It is a really phenomenal read um, from an organizational, uh, strategic organizational perspective. So I, I would definitely recommend it. So really, really briefly now, and this is another lens on this idea of, of organizational growth. We're going to very briefly just talk about a few principles that inform a lot of this work. Um, Moore's Law, which is which is something many of you are, are probably familiar with. And I'm seeing some audio and freezing issues in the chat, Gabby. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, I've seen them. And it's it's all dependent on your personal, your whatever network you're connected to right now, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. okay. I sometimes have to create like a mobile hotspot, but um, I'm sorry, folks. Okay, no, no problem. I'm gonna. It looks like some folks are some, some folks are still. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna press on. Thanks. Um, so briefly, want to mention Moore's law, which is this idea by Gordon Moore that, that he proposed in 1965 that, that basically the number of transistors on a microchip doubles about every two years, while the cost is uh, also falls by half. And this is something that's held from 1965 all the way through through today, and it's this exponential growth curve in how technology has evolved. Um, there's a, I read this great um, anecdote the other day that you know, if any of you have an Apple iWatch, um, there's actually more computing power just in, in your, on your wrist than was available to, um, to NASA throughout the entirety of the Apollo program in the 1960s. So that's just an, you know, a tangible illustration of how that, how that um, law manifests. And what Martek did on the graph here, you can see, is he basically took that and says, okay, it's not just the microchips, it's actually technology overall, which changes exponentially. Yet our social systems, you know, are more incremental and logarithmic. So as that gap widens, um, there, there's an increasing dissonance between, you know, the technology that we utilize and our systems, our organizations that, uh, that can that cope with that. So how do we adapt? Um, and what he proposes is we need to become more adaptive, more agile, which is we hear all the time, right? But what does that really mean? Um, and what I'm going to propose today is that an understanding of networks can actually help us bridge that gap without the need for, for any type of, of really radical transformational efforts, um, which are a lot easier in the private sector, uh, in, the, in the government, that's, that can sometimes be called a revolution. It's not necessarily something that I think any of us want. And then the final M, as far as laws, that we're going to touch on is, is Metcalf's law. Um, and this is something, this is the most math we're going to go into today, I promise. Um, but what Metcalf proposes is that the, um, the effect of a network or the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of connected users. And I, I know that's kind of heavy, so a good anecdote to use to describe that is um, if you think of a telephone. Um, the first telephone, uh, the value of that telephone is only as great as the number of people you can call, right? So there's a great, I used to work in sales before my government career, and, and there was a great, a great joke in sales that uh, the hardest sale ever was the first telephone, right? Um, and so the, the idea that the value of that phone, the value of that network, will increase exponentially based upon the number of folks that are connected, right? It's not just a one-to-one -one growth. Um, because you're now connecting not just to one other person, but you know, to two other people, and they're also connecting not just to you, but each other. So it's a great way of seeing, um, uh, of seeing how that principle applies uh, to networks as well. Um, this is something that has, has shown up uh, largely in, in time to market for a lot of innovations that we see nowadays. So for example, you know, airlines, when they first came out, it took 64 years for airlines uh, to reach 50 million users. Um, and then as you move up through the years, through the eras, we get all the way up to um, WeChat took only a year, and then Pokemon Go, just a couple years ago, only needed 19 days to reach 50 million users. And that's really because, and that's because of and due to Metcalf's law, this idea that the network is going to be val more valuable based on the number of people that are connected. And there are limitations to that. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit as well. So how do networks help here? Um, and now we're really going to start shifting into some of the into some of the cool stuff. So 
as I said, we're not really going to radically evolve or transform our government structures overnight. Unfortunately, we don't have to, right? We can recruit, we can increase um, the resilience and the agility of organizations um, and network science and a better understanding of some of these principles is really is really the key here. So another another term that people have used to describe networks is, is uh, called shadow systems. Um, and in recognition of the fact that uh, they can really remain hidden or unseen um, and often taken for granted. But nature really has this invisible blueprint. Um, and if we don't understand how networks function, we really can't understand how markets function, how organizations solve problems, and how societies change. So what what if we could actually see a map of those systems? And what if we could actually bring them out of the shadows? So let's take an actual real world example of, um, of what network modeling looks like. And this is a real example uh, from a real company. Uh, names have been changed. Uh, but they were losing about $750 million a year because they weren't able to move uh, ideas and innovation across the organization. They tried databases, they tried committees and initiatives, uh, yet nothing was working. So they had the foresight to ask uh, a really simple question, and that's can we map the network? Right? Can we see who's interacting with whom, how they're getting their work done uh, in regards to how information flows throughout the workplace? So on the left uh, of your screen here, you can see the, the formal hierarchical structure uh, that we're all used to. And on the right is the informal network. Now you can think of this as basically a graphical representation of who you turn to in order to get your work done. So when we take this view, we can actually get uh, drastically different insights uh, around who is critical for the operation, uh, who has influence, how ideas flow, and how best practices uh, and ideas may be stalling within the organization. For example, um, most people's eyes uh, are immediately drawn to Wheeler here on the network map, who's very central in terms of information flow uh, within the group, but not nearly as prominent in the formal organizational structure and kind of hidden away as a, as a, a key opinion leader or an influencer. So what would happen if Wheeler left the, the organization? So if you're looking at the org chart, um, it's just a vacant box, right? But if you look at the network map, I mean, wow, there's there's a huge hole now in terms of the interconnection among employees, which which can lead to corresponding breaks in the diffusion of ideas and information. So, in addition to looking at centrality, uh, in in Wheeler's case, we should also be looking at uh, at the fringes, on the outsides of the network to see where potential and opportunity is being missed. So in this case, Sanders um, just so happened to be a very talented new hire that this company spent a lot of time, energy, and money um, wooing away from a competitor. And yet, once they got her in the door, uh, they did nothing to onboard her in a productive way or to really incorporate her and introduce her to the group. So after about six months, uh, she left taking her, her valuable expertise, her outsider's perspective with her, um, along with all that, that time, energy, and expense that was invested in her, in her recruitment. Now, if we look at Lopez over here in green, um, Lopez is important not so much because of the number of ties, but because of the bridging ties across functional lines. And if you get these people um, with their perspectives involved in, uh, in brainstorming sessions, you're much more likely to get productive results because these employees really have a, a holistic perspective um, and have a sense of what will work in different areas of the organization um, because they have these connections with different technical specializations. And finally, um, if you're looking carefully, you may have noticed by now that there's also a pretty distinct silo that we can see here that's kind of cleaved off uh, from the rest of the group in this informal network. Now, knowing this can, can help you to intentionally integrate members of this group uh, in future cross-functional efforts. So hopefully this, um, hopefully this example helps to give you just a, a sort of high-level overview of how the ability to see networks 
um, can really be critical to your team, your work group, um, and, and ultimately your, your organization's success. So we're going to we're going to move on next to personal networks. But I, I want to pause and just take a moment um, to see if there's any questions from anyone on anything that I, I've mentioned thus far. And I actually saw, I did see one in the chat, and it went by pretty quickly, but but I think I saw somebody ask if there are tools um, available uh, for this type of analysis, and uh, and there actually are. And that was actually a question that I was going to, going to turn around and, and ask of uh, the participants here as well in recognition of of the experience that exists out here in the group, uh, what it's called is, you know, it's, it's called organizational network analysis within a, a corporate context um, or social network analysis within a personal context. And it's and uh, there are tools that you can use. Um, that they can be a little tricky only because they're only going to be as valuable as the questions you ask. So when you're talking about mapping a network, for example, you know, I could ask who likes bananas. And we'll have a great network map of everyone who likes bananas, um, but is it really going to be useful? So there's a lot of questions that come into play around these systems. With um, there's some privacy implications, obviously. Um, there are also some some sort of trust, foundational trust uh, questions too, because your 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 data is only going to be as good as the response as you get. So um, if if trust is low in your organization, uh, that's something that you might want to address first uh, before you look at something like this. But it really depends. Um, there are a lot of companies that, uh, that do this type of work. Um, you can even do it on an informal basis too. But again, you want to make sure that that you are um, doing it correctly so that you get at accurate data. Um, and the chat's going by pretty quick, but I do see some people who looks like they've used um, used some of these systems, social network analysis, before. Um, how do you engage people like Sanders so they feel integrated? Um, that's a great question. I think it really. I mean, it really comes down to the, you know, um, to the individual context, right? Um, I mean, onboarding in a productive way is obviously really important. Um, that's probably only going to go so far, though, um, because you, when you're talking about integrating them into the network of the organization, you want to make sure they have the relationships that they need to succeed. Um, and that's going to look different depending upon, you know, what their job is, uh, where they sit, who they work with. Um, but if they, you know, in that case, that was illustrating how somebody couldn't access the people they needed to succeed in their job. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, and if you're not providing that for your team or for your people, uh, you're going to create additional challenges. Uh, Kumu, yes, Kumu is a system uh, I see Andrew mentioning. That's um, that's a that's a good that's a good one. I've, I've, I'm familiar with that. I haven't used it extensively, but um, I have I've heard good things about it. Um, there are a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of open source software you can actually use for these types of visualizations. Um, Gephi is one. Um, there's also a lot you can do with, with an R as far as um, statistical packages for for network analysis too. How do you begin to map an organization? That's a great question. Um, I'm actually going to hold that one for the next uh, the next section because we're going to we're going to touch on that, um, and it can be as complicated as you know writing a computer program or as simple as sitting down with a, a piece of paper and a, and a pencil. Um, but we're actually going to we will touch on that. So um, I encourage you to continue if you have questions, ask them. And I know Kim and, and Siobhan will will make note of any particular ones and, and bring them to my to my attention. Um, anything, Kim or Siobhan, that you guys have seen, that, like any common themes that I've missed in the chat that we should touch on before we press forward? Um, I'll let you answer. Um, I saw a few. Um, just bear with me one moment. I had um, jotted some of them down. Thank you, Sarah. Just has thoughts on making an impact in this capacity when you are not at the top leadership in the organization. That's great. That's a great question. It really comes down to the, that that age-old question of leadership, um, that definition of leadership as, as is, are we looking at it as positional authority? Um, and there's a lot of ways you can do it. Um, 
you know, within the Park Service, uh, uh, one of the ways I got started in this work was through employee resource groups, uh, which are which are networks, right? Ultimately, um, building connections and building your network actually individually on a, on a personal level um, can actually have an impact on uh, on on some of those organizational levels as, as well. If you're talking specifically about um, utilizing a mapping system like this. Um, I can't, I, then it would probably depend upon the specifics of your organization. Um, but there are entry points that you can, you can probably find informally. Um, this, this type of work is, I think it's so compelling that it almost kind of, it almost kind of sells itself in some respects. Um, so I think ultimately it's about connecting with like-minded people who are, who are passionate as well, um, and, and sort of pushing for, for some of this, this work, these changes. Dylan, uh, this is Siobhan. Um, I, I did see a question. How could one do some analysis on identifying what the informal networks are? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I think I hate to say it depends <laughs> because, it, because it sounds like a cop-out. Um, I, I think ultimately, if you're interested in in, in those types of, of questions and and in learning about those sort of informal um, systems or those networks, uh, the the biggest thing you can do is just sort of become more aware of of this work, right? Become more aware of how networks function. Um, I've got a lot of resources at the end of the slide deck here, which offer some really phenomenal. Um, uh, you know, reading on on this work too, which I would point you to. Um, but ultimately, it's it's really about developing the network of relationships yourself, um, because that's going to broaden your perspective and, and your sort of awareness of of the you know what exists out there. I mean, different organizations have such different operating contexts that it's it's hard to say with any degree of uncertainty across the board. Um, some, some have, you know, informal sort of social networks. Some groups will utilize systems like like, like Slack or, or um, actual network sort of, in, you know, uh, interconnectivity platforms. I know we in our department have just made the switch to Microsoft, which actually has some some pretty cool back-end analytics features on a personal level where you can actually visualize your network. Um, and it, it's 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 narrow, it's only the people that you collaborate with frequently, but it is a tool that you can start to use. There's a lot of systems out there. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to move on to the next section, but I encourage you to, you know, if you have questions, continue to throw them in the chat. And um, we'll Actually, Dylan, to... this is Kim, I just wanted to say you have a lot of time, so, um, so we're actually ahead of schedule. If you want to take a, a couple more questions, you can. And then I also want to say some folks are having a hard time hearing, so if you could uh, speak a little bit closer to your phone, that'd be great. So if you want to take a couple yeah. more, um, we still have, we go until 2.30, so we have uh, we have quite a bit of time. Great, excellent, perfect. Um, and yeah, I saw those, I, I saw those uh, comments in chat about being hard to hear. I apologize, I, um, I've tried uh, I tried monkeying with my headset, which sometimes is a culprit and it doesn't seem like it's made much of a difference. Um, but I am trying to talk directly into it and I hope that, I hope that helps people. So um, let's see if there's a couple more pieces here that we can answer. Um, uh, there's some facets of an organizational culture that make networks work better from one group over another. Absolutely, yes, um, for sure. Um, there, there, there are unquestionably pieces of, of an organization's culture that come into play here. For example, um, if you have a culture within the organization that is intolerant of uh, of, shall we say, of dissent or, or anything that's sort of uh, narratives that run counter to the status quo, that's going to have a disproportionate effect upon the diffusion of ideas uh, throughout your network, right? So, so those those are absolutely really important pieces. Um, one of the one of the resources that I recommend at the end actually is a phenomenal book um, on uh, on organizational culture because I think that that they, it really is a, another side to this coin. Um, you can't really have have one without the other. I'm hearing some people's audio is improved. That's good. 
Thank you, Dylan. All right. Great. Yeah, no problem. All right, so I'm going to move on uh, a bit here uh, and to, to switch lenses. I'm actually going to use uh, uh, to, to give a quick plug to uh, to something that Kim has uh, been developing, and I give her a tremendous amount of credit for this. Uh, this database on um, federal communities of practice, and communities of practice um, are our networks uh, by all means, um, really valuable, great ways of connecting and learning um, from people, sharing information, resources. Um, connecting and collaborating. So there actually is a database, and, and uh, Kim, I forget how many groups you have on it um, right now. Can you, do you have a, a count on how many different sure. groups? I'm not sure how many, but the slides just disappeared. So I am going to, I'm going to share my screen. Um, oh. So if you okay. hold us one, one moment, I will uh, get to your slide. Okay. And uh, so I don't know how many how many folks I or how many communities I do have on the, the listserv, but I did attach that to your seminar materials. And just as a disclaimer, it is uh, it's definitely a draft, and I'm sure there are there things that need to be updated. And just as I've gone along, I've, I've found communities and and seen their listservs, and so I've kind of compiled them. Uh, if you have some to add, please let me know or updates on links. Um, I would love to to hear about it. So. Um, so definitely pass that information along, and I will um, I will be sure to add it to the list. So it's it's definitely an informal <laughs> informal list, but hopefully it's helpful to you. So I am just trying to go ahead and and start the slideshow from my computer. So um, let me know if folks are seeing it. I just want to check to see, Gabby, can you see the slides? Not yet, Kim. Okay. It's, now I can. I okay, can see great. And, your uh, slide deck for communities of practice. Yes. So, Dylan, are you still connected by phone? I am, yeah, and I just, I don't okay. know why Adobe's doing that. Um, I, I will advance the slides for right you. Here. Okay. Yeah. All right, that sounds good. So you can go ahead. Okay, I'm I'm just okay. There we go. Now I see it. Great. All right. So you can go ahead and switch to uh, to the next to talk about personal networks. Great. Okay. Um, so as I said, switching lenses here to, um, to to talk about personal networks. I wanted to I wanted to mention that community practice lister because that's something that. Uh, I see as an example of something that really benefits both um, both the organizational lens and then, um, as we're going to talk about next, uh, the personal lens. So let's do uh, let's use just a super quick poll here, um, and I don't think we have the uh, the Adobe the actual like poll function enabled. So um, to Kim, if you'll advance, uh, what we'll do is we'll just utilize the chat uh, here. So go ahead and just enter the number in here for um, for the answer to this question. Uh, you know, one for you set aside dedicated time, two for sporadic, three for you don't really think about it, four for you know it's important, but not really sure where to start. And the question is, how often uh, do you devote time to cultivating your network? Great. So. I'm seeing a good mix of numbers here. 
everything from very little ones all the way uh, all the way up to uh, looks like some people have actually said five too, which <laughs> I'm not sure what option that is. But, um, so yeah, all, all over all over the map, right? Um, this is where having the, the pull feature might be nice because we can we can actually see specifically how many uh, you know what the breakdown is, which I'd be curious about. But uh, general, I can tell you that when I generally ask this question, um, the the answer that normally comes up is is four. Um, you know, people people generally know that it's important, um, but they're not sure how to do it effectively um, or where to start. Kim, it looks like your slide just just went down. <laughs> I can't see your screen now. So sorry, uh, they, they did. So um, this is a this is a test for uh, patients and, and dealing with <laughs> everyone in the world being on uh, networks now instead of being in person. So again, I apologize yeah. for folks that are having to wait. Uh, actually, uh, let me let me try to. Dylan, are you reconnected? I am. Yeah. Although it doesn't look like I'm a presenter right now. Okay, and Gabby, if you can come back on the phone and, and help us. And sorry, everyone, for um, Hi, Dylan. the Hi Dylan. Hi, Dylan, it's Gabby. You should be able to screen share now, and I see that you are doing so. And thanks, thanks. folks. Thanks. I know Adobe is not ideal, but with this many folks, it's kind of our only option. Thanks. Um, yeah. Thank thanks, you everyone. so much, Gabby. I know we've all been there before, but I know it's frustrating. So thanks for your, thanks for your patience and bearing with it. Okay, so um, so now this is kind of the big question. It's the so what question, right? Um, why does this why does this really matter? Um, well, uh, Ronald Burt, who's this uh, really great professor at uh, University of Chicago Blue School, has done a lot of work on on networks, um, and he's actually found that just by educating leaders about network principles and structures and debunking a lot of the myths and fallacies, you can actually lead to a pretty, an absolutely incredible, actually, um, improvement in, in both performance and in likelihood of promotion. So understanding these systems, um, understanding how networks work is really important. And, uh, we, you know, I think we all know typically, and this is something that's true in both the private and the public sectors, that employees will will rise up in ranks through um, a strong command of the technical elements of their job. Uh, most of them really have a nose to the grindstone work ethic um, and a focus on accomplishing objectives. And at some point, as you make that transition into supervision management, uh, you're really going to be challenged to move behind those functional specialties um, and address the strategic issues. And it's tough for a lot of us to immediately grasp that um, and be, be, because it really moves to involving relational uh, rather than purely analytical tasks. Uh, nor, nor is it easy to understand that the exchanges and interactions um, with, with stakeholders are, are not distractions from your, your quote, real work, but are actually at the heart of, of your new leadership role. So just, just understanding that and, and, and introducing yourself to, to some of these ideas can really have a profound, uh, profound influence and impact. So let's do a quick word association here. Um, I'm going to put a word up on the screen. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to give me the first thought that comes into your head. Uh, so there's no right or wrong answers, uh, just first initial impressions. Okay, people communication, communicating, stress. <laughs> Connections exhausting, <laughs> time together, cool, yeah, awesome. So what we'll find is when we think about networking specifically, a lot of people's minds pretty quickly go to that idea of a uh, wallet full of business cards, you know, the mixer, the idea that you need to go out there and, 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 and grind it out and meet people and, and actually specifically make these connections um, to benefit your career, right, and to benefit your network. Um, so, having said that, if you want, if you can picture that, the picture of what that idea of networking is to you, um, I'll, I'll give you one more, one more piece here. I'm going to put two incomplete words on the screen, 
And what I'd like you to do is complete the two words in the chat. So there's two letters missing from each word. Just go ahead and fill those in and, and type in the two complete words that you'd make uh, in, in chat. Stop with some shop. Wish. Soap and soap and wash. Soup. Swap. Cool. Awesome. This is actually really this is actually really good breakdown. So it's cool to see. Um, so there was a study uh, done by by researchers at Harvard uh, and other universities that found that even thinking about networking um, in that in that specific frame um, that we used of, of handing out the business cards and grinding it out, uh, left at, left people feeling dirty or actually morally tainted. Uh, and they found it increased their desire for cleanliness and, and led to some of these, these subtle shifts in cognition. For example, um, if you were one of those people that took that sort of dim view of networking, uh, you would be far more likely to fill in the letters to create soap uh, and wash uh, rather than soup or wish, um, and and that type of intention, it's called intentional networking, um, which is that idea of networking specifically for professional growth uh, was associated with some of those um, those more negative connotations. So it's great that actually a lot of you didn't say that, which is outstanding. Um, the people that uh, the people that approach this from the standpoint of personal networking, which is not that idea of I must do this to get that. Uh, but more of a, an approach um, that, that we'll actually talk about on the next slide, far, far less likely to, to have that sort of negative connotation. So let's examine and debunk some of the myths and some of those negative fallacies that lead to, to those, um, those negative connotations. So the first one is a lot of people approach uh, their network from the perspective of have to, like, aha, I have to do this, you know. Um, so let's flip that on its head first and foremost, and instead of thinking about that, you know, what can you do for me? Let's think instead about reciprocity, growth, and, and more of an abundance mindset. Um, and that's actually, it, it might sound kind of Pollyannish, but that's actually the way we approach things within personal networks, largely. If you're just going out to have coffee with somebody with no ulterior motives of, oh my gosh, I've got to like connect with this person because of ABC, um, you're far more likely to be thinking about this anyway. Um, so, so change your mindset uh, and think about think about it from that personal standpoint, um, and think about what you can offer um, to those in your network, rather than that sort of icky feeling of, of selfishness. The second myth here um, is that extroverts make the best networkers, um, and that's actually not true. Uh, extroversion is definitely correlated with intensity of networking, but intensity is not correlated with effectiveness, right? So if we're talking about actually actual effective networking. I mean, I can call somebody, I can call you 30 times in one day because I really want to talk to you, but I'm probably going to piss you off. So that's probably going to backfire on me. So just because, I mean, if you happen to be a great extrovert, um, that can be an advantage from the standpoint of energy um, in, in reaching out and making these connections, but it's really not, it's not essential. And if you're an introvert, you shouldn't feel like you're behind the curve here. Um, and just think about different ways you can connect. So instead of thinking about all these people you have to connect with and exhausting yourself, pick one or two people who you're going to intentionally connect with or reconnect with um, to, to grow your network. And that can be just as effective, um, if not more effective. The third one is this idea of more is better um, that we sort of highlighted in number two as well. Um, and and that's, that is not true at all when it comes to networks. And this is where uh, Metcalf's law, as we were talking about, the value of a network is proportional to the square of the users, actually hits a wall is when it comes to people, right? Because we can only connect with so many people uh, before we're going to be exhausted, right? We're not a computer uh, system. So so it isn't the case that quantity is better than quality. It, it's really the opposite. You want to have, um, have, have those quality connections with people. Um, diverse connections too, not just within your group, but with people outside your group as well that will really make you more effective. And then finally is that this last one that we touched on before, uh, you don't have to be uh, narcissistic or egotistical to focus on yourself, right? It's just not true. Um, there's actually some really fascinating research that shows when you, when you approach someone to ask them for a favor, 
uh, far from looking down on you, they'll actually think more highly of you. Um, and that's because, well, first, uh, you know, you came to them, so they must be pretty cool, right? <laughs> and then second is the fact that um, they will actually subconsciously start to start to rationalize why they should help you, right? So they'll start to think back and like, oh, well, they did this for me back then, and oh, we had this conversation then, it was cool. And uh, they're probably not even aware of that. But all those things, all those calculations are going through in their minds to, to figure out why, you know, why they should, why they should help you. Um, and then, of course, that idea of abundance and reciprocity, you want to, you want to articulate that you help them as well. So, so now that we've debunked some of those myths, um, let's flip it around and look at some of the ways that networks actually form. Um, because understanding how networks form is, is equally critical to, to working within them. And the first and the most, um, the most important point here is that our relationships do not form at random, right? There are really five factors that, that drive relationships. Um, the first one is frequency. And that is pretty simple, right? Uh, the more you interact with someone, the stronger the bond is going to be. The second is density. Uh, density is about shared connections, and the idea here is that if you, um, if you think about, uh, I'm trying to think back to like high school, right, and if you know five people, um, and, and those five people all know the same person that you don't yet know, um, odds are it's just a matter of time before you meet that person, right, because you're all connected through five separate people, right, so there's five ways that you could potentially be introduced to that that individual. Uh, so the, so the, the more density, um, the more connections and the more opportunities for a connection that you're going to have. Now, the third factor is proximity, and proximity actually has an exponentially it has an exponential factor on the first two, right? Uh, because the closer you are, um, the more frequently your connections will probably be, and the, the greater the density of your connections as well. Um, and it also lowers the friction uh, for chance interactions, right? If you're close to someone, you, you may just bump into them. Next is identity, and this is kind of, this is going back to like high school or college, um, those sort of crucibles or those points in your life where you're really defining who you are. Um, the people that are around you during those crucibles um, are going to be really powerful influencers and partners, and you're going to be far more open to incorporating them uh, into your network. And then finally um, is difficulties or that idea of like a shared sacrifice or a shared challenge, right? Uh, if you're going to do something hard, uh, if you're working on a difficult problem and you're doing that with a group of people, uh, you're gonna be far more open to, to bringing them into your network. Um, I had a colleague who was uh, one of the senior drill instructors uh, at Quantico, and uh, he liked to muse about how he would, he would spend all of his time with, with new recruits uh, in the Marine Corps trying to, trying to make them, you know, break them down and make their life hell. Um, and then at the end of the time, they would all be crying because they had to leave. Uh, and, and he would laugh and joke about it. Um, but this is a principle that um, that the military has really uh, done done a great job seizing on. And, you know, SEALs, Rangers, everyone, this idea of, of working together with people uh, on something very difficult, and very challenging is an incredibly bonding factor. Uh, and it leads to really, really strong, strong networks. So an understanding of an understanding of these five factors can really help us it can help us help make us more aware of how our current networks have evolved, possibly, um, if you look at these factors uh, within your own network. And then also how we can take actions to, to really proactively influence uh, our, the growth and the development of our network. So use these principles to your advantage, right? They might seem simple, um, and, and they are, really, but, um, but we really, we're rarely intentional about, about putting, them, putting them into practice. So uh, now that we've talked about some of the myths um, and we've talked about some of those factors and principles, um, what, uh, what I want to do now is really look at what network science shows us are the, the three keys or the three best practices um, to, to having that successful and high-performing network. Um, and here it is. It's, um, it's an ego, right? <laughs> Um, this is a, this actually a meme that circulates on, on social media quite frequently, um, and I just uh, I find it I find it both both funny and amusing, uh, but also actually really kind of true. Uh, if you think about 
how communication can function and, and, and how you can connect with people. Um, so, you know, in addition to being a, in addition to being a great sort of common bond and um, inconceivable, yes, I see, some, I see some folks already teasing that in the chat. Um, uh, it also has some really cool, um, it incorporates some of those really cool principles things that, that we're talking about. So feel free to uh, feel free to utilize that one in the future. And just to make sure folks know, this is from Princess Bride. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Of course. Princess Bride, Amigo Montoya, Randy Pitts, and classic, classic film, cult, cult favorite. <laughs> and right, Dylan, so, I just wanted to break in one second. Yeah. I think some folks are having problems uh, hearing still. If you could maybe speak a little bit mm -hmm. um, slower and and uh, and just a little bit louder. Maybe not as close to the mic, but just a little bit louder. Thank you. I can try. I can try. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So we, I've thrown a lot. I've thrown a lot at you um, uh, on this topic, um, but I want to. I want to kind of break this down into three really critical points right here, um, as far as keys to those effective uh, personal networks. And this can be personal within the context of your work network or or a personal network. It really, it doesn't matter. We're we're sort of looking at it within the realm of of your work life and your work network. Um, but the principles are universal. Um, so the first one here is. The, the highest performers, when you look at their networks, are those that have what's called an open network. Um, and a couple of quotes here from, from David Rock uh, and from David Berkus um, on, on this concept of what is an open network. Basically, most people, or many people, uh, will spend their careers or their lives in closed networks. Uh, and closed networks are groups of people who already know each other really well, right? Uh, people frequently stay in the same industry, uh, the same religion, the same political party, right? It's easier to work within that network because you know the acronyms, you know the culture, you know those those unspoken rules and norms, uh, and you've built up trust, and it's comfortable, right? But many studies show the opposite is actually a better predictor of success, and that is if you have an open network, um, it's going to be far more powerful and uh, a really key predictor of your individual performance over time. And our networks, our individual networks are powerful uh, when they have these bridging ties, or what are called bridging or brokering ties, which, which connect into other domains of expertise. And these really help to generate you know, diverse sets of possibilities and insights. And these are insights which uh, other people from the outside may frequently attribute to just luck or maybe just being in the right place at the right time, which is what a lot of us think sometimes when you know when something good happens to someone. But it might actually be because they have these um, you know these types of connections within their networks. And uh, one one case study in this in this uh, is uh, Steve Jobs, right? Who uh, the course of his, in the course of his career he he came into contact with uh, computer scientists, engineers, designers, musicians. He had this really cataclysmic fall, um, this, this crucible where he really had to struggle, uh, found himself, and then when he reemerged as Apple's CEO, he was able to synthesize the diversity of his experiences into his leadership philosophy. And he once um, he once famously defined creativity as just connecting things. Right? He said uh, he said that when you ask creative people how they did something. Uh, they usually feel a little guilty because they feel like they really didn't do anything, right? They just saw something uh, and connected different experiences to synthesize that new idea, which I think is a really beautiful definition of creativity, and it really illustrates this point, um, is that if you have access to information um, from another group and other people don't have that access, you're obviously going to be at an advantage, right? Um, so. This takes work, uh, right? Because it's not easy and it's often uncomfortable. Um, but if, but if you work at it uh, and you're aware of it and cognizant of it, um, it can it can be a really powerful factor in creating an effective network. Uh, the second key that we're going to talk about, um, I'm sure this is probably not going to come as a surprise to anyone here, um, but we have seen a, a huge explosion in the collaborative demands that we place upon people. Um, just in the last 10 years. Um, so let me ask just for, for the sake of, uh, of illustration, um, 
I'll ask you, how much of your day by percent would you say you spend communicating or collaborating with others? Uh, so that's, you know, consider in-person email, phone, meetings. So just talk like a percentage in the chat there. Um, I'm curious to see what folks say. I'm seeing a lot of high numbers. <laughs> I don't think I've seen anything below 50% to this point. A couple, but most people are pretty high up. I see a lot of 80s and 90s. Yeah, and that and that jives pretty well with what a lot of the research says. Um, just in the last 10 years, um, here's some of the averages. Um, and now the ranges are because this uh, this fluctuates depending upon where you sit in the organization. So the higher, generally speaking, the higher you are in your chart, the more of your time you're going to spend um, in collaboration with others. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily hold true 100%. Um, so the, that's why the range is here. But essentially, what we get what we get here is most leaders nowadays say they spend almost 90% of their time on email, phone, or in meetings, um, and that's up from 65% as recently as 10 years ago. So the key practice here and the key principle is that we we really need to be we need to conscientiously reduce those collaborative demands because nobody can continue at that pace. Um, forever, right? You know, you're, you're going to reach a point of burnout, um, and you're going to reach a point of diminishing returns, um, you know, in that engagement. So you have to, you know, it's easier said than done, obviously, but, you know, you have to be very proactive in, in setting some parameters and some um, some guidelines as far as how you how you collaborate, you know. Um, and I see some uh, some folks saying it depends upon the organization or agency. It definitely does, yeah, for sure. Um, it, it's none of this is universal across the board, um, but these are the sort of general trends that that we're seeing out there, and this is both private, this is private and public sector both lumped together. Uh, okay, and then the last one to talk about here um, is actually it's a behavioral element, um, and that is to build these connections that create energy. And it sounds kind of squishy, and not really, you know not really clear on what that might be. So I guess a good way of illustrating this might be, you know, have you ever worked with somebody who, and I'm sure we may have <laughs> at various points, who you just attempted to avoid at all costs? You know, there's that person in the office who was like an energy succubus, right? And they could just kill the productivity and the morale of a work group and a team faster than anything else, right? Um, that is that is absolutely true, um, and those um, those types of uh, you know I hate to speak in generalities or stereotypes, but um, it does happen, and that is a significant factor in effectiveness um, of groups. Um, well, the opposite is actually also really true here. Um, there are people who actually create energy and enthusiasm, right? And that. This factor, actually, the third factor here about creating energy and opportunities tur actually turns out to be about four times the predictor of a high-performing employee as any other factor, right? These people who are – these energizers really get more from people around them. They foster this type of divergent uh, creative thinking in their interactions, and in doing so, <clears throat> they actually create opportunities not just for themselves but also for others. Um, <clears throat> CEV and Gartner has actually done some really cool research on this. Um, they actually call them uh, enterprise contributors. I think is the term they use too, which are people who have uh, who, who have these these qualities. You know, this quality of generating energy um, and enthusiasm. And it's not just roses and daisies. Um, it's actually genuinely creating um, these types of connections with people. All right. So. Um, Somebody had asked earlier how you how you do this, how you get started um, when you're talking about your network, because obviously these principles are only as effective as our ability to see them, right? So how do you see them? Uh, well, the, the short answer is you have to visualize your network. You have to be able to see it, right? Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, the, the graphic that I have here on the screen, this is a visualization probably from three or four years ago of, of um, of my uh, my LinkedIn network actually, um, and unfortunately the uh, the API with LinkedIn has changed now, so they don't allow you you don't have the same access to your information as you once did. So, like the system the system that created this visualization doesn't work anymore. Otherwise, I would love to share it with everyone uh, and encourage you to do so. Unfortunately, um, it's 
found the way of the dinosaur and the dodo. But there are other ways that you can do this um, as well, uh, and they can actually be more beneficial. For example, um, a number of different groups just start with a piece of paper and a pencil, right? Like I, I think I alluded to earlier. Um, just, just think about for a moment, and you have to take some time to do this, right? Um, and it's probably going to be an iterative process because you're not going to be able to create it all in one sitting. Um, but really start to be more cognizant and aware of, of who you are connecting with on a daily basis. And again, think about the parameters that you're going to use to define your network, right? It could be anything from a specific project that you're working on um, all the way up to, I mean, if you want to map your entire network, go for it. You know, it'll take you longer, obviously, but, but you can do it. Um, it just it just takes some time and some, some effort to do so. Um, so the first thing you really need to do is you need to visualize your network. You need to be able to see these relationships, right? Um, the next thing you do once you have a map like this, um, and and this can be this is easier done when you have a computer program like this because you're able to actually create the ties between your ties, uh, which can be harder to do if you're just doing this on your own with a piece of paper. But if you can actually identify your groups of, of strong densities uh, of connectivity, uh, then you can really find your macro groups, right? So, so in this illustration here, the two circles, the, the two circles in red are well, one of this in red is my sort of professional network um, within the National Park Service on the right, um, and then on the left, that other really dense connection, I I will sheepishly admit, is my college acapella group. <laughs> So obviously a lot of strong connections remaining from, from that period of my life. Um, the next thing you, you want to do here is you want to find those bridging nodes, right? Uh, find those, those nodes that, uh, that, connect, uh, that connect those different groups, right? Because those are those brokers and those bridging ties um, that, that have, that have that, the access to both, both groups and different domains of expertise. So, so think about those, um, those people who, who bridge those ties. Uh, and then finally, uh, pay attention to the outliers, right? If there are people on the exterior of your network, like we talked about within the organizational context, those uh, Sanders is, um, think about why they're on the exterior and what you might be missing in terms of, of your connectivity to them. Um, I see somebody asking what tool I, I use for this mapping. Unfortunately, this tool doesn't exist anymore. Actually, I thought about cutting this visualization just because it's, it's not something that uh, – that, that is accessible at this point. But a few people in the chat have mentioned Kumu, which is something that does, it, it's, very, it's very much like this. It's a network illustration tool, uh, K-U-M-U, um, which you can do a search for. I believe it's open source. Um, so uh, feel free to look that up. And there's a lot of other ones too. Gephi, uh, G-E-P-H-I, I believe, is another um, computer-based uh, modeling tool um, that, that they all do sort of the same thing. Um, but again, you know, just I would encourage you to be mindful of the fact that these tools are only as effective as the data that you put into them. So you still have to do that work of, of thinking about your connections and thinking about um, where they are and, and where they sit. Um, but totally encourage you to do so. It's really, it just gives you, it opens up your, your view immensely when you can see, see these things. And finally, you know, let's take just a couple minutes uh, as we wind down here to talk about the dark side of networks, because uh, there are some, right? Um, and we, you know, we, we see them probably, you know, social media just exemplifies a lot of the echo chambers and the groups think that, that come with this first one, and that is this idea of homophily, which in network science, it basically just means this idea of, uh, it's the birds of a feather concept. And we talked about it when we were talking about closed networks that you really, you will naturally gravitate towards people similar to yourself uh, because it's more comfortable and because it's efficient. You know, you speak the same language, you have the same cultural norms, et cetera. Um, but this makes, this this will get you into one of those closed networks, right? Um, and this is where Paula Abdul actually got it really wrong, you know. <laughs> it's not opposites that attract, it's actually similarity uh, that really attracts. So, you know, these are our strong ties are generally with people that we share a lot of commonality. Um, that we spend most of our time with, you know, they, and we have common access to resources. So you're really not broadening or diversifying your access to expertise uh, if you're in one of these closed systems. You're also going to be far more likely to fall victim to groupthink, Abilene Paradox, um, 
you know, there's probably going to be maybe even a little bit of a lack of psychological safety that really can spell doom for for an organization. So be mindful, be mindful of this. Now, the second piece here is we talked about the social limitations of Metcalf's law briefly. That idea of a sum is good. Uh, more is actually worse after a certain point, right? So you really want to focus on on quality connections here. Um, and in network sciences, it's, it's, it's the difference between what we call strong ties and weak ties. Um, weak ties are people who you might talk to maybe once or twice a year, maybe. So they're not strong in the sense that you're not working with them regularly, but you are still connected with them, and you still have that, that um, avenue. Um, and because they're a weaker tie and you don't work with them regularly, you're often probably going to be exposed to different areas of expertise. Uh, and the same thing is true as what's called dormant ties, which are people that you may have been really close with at one point, but maybe you've lost touch with over the years. Um, so as you've gone in different directions, um, your, your perspectives um, are going to be different now. And if you reconnect at this point, and so they're called dormant ties, um, you'll find you can, actually, you can actually benefit from your previously strong connection and, you know, as well as that, that diversity of expertise and experience that you've had since you since you separated. And the final piece here when we talk about the dark sides of networks is um, is this idea of it's called preferential attachment, and that essentially is the rich get richer, right? Um, and, and that is that you know we generally we generally reward what people already already have a lot of, right? And this is all based upon math, actually. Network science is is, is an incredible um, confluence of math and social science, which is pretty cool. So if you're interested in that at all, I encourage you to check it out. Um, but there actually are mathematical calculations that, that can predict how the nodes that are ahead get picked more often by other nodes simply because they're ahead um, a significant amount of time. So they were just a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, a little bit faster. And because of that, they got picked for more coaching, Maybe they went to a summer training camp and they got better faster. So it's that, it's, that's a, just a great illustration of that principle. And that's something that happens in all social systems, um, particularly, particularly in networks. So some tips here as we, as we finish up here. Um, and I know I've, I've, I've thrown a ton of stuff at you today, um, and it's all on the slides here, uh, so feel free to come back to it, and feel free to reach out to me anytime, too. Um, but just some general tips for you as we, as we close here, and some sort of some of those next steps. Um, first and foremost, you really have to be intentional and strategic in this work, as we talked about. So you really have to define your goal. Um, what are the parameters of your network that you'd like to focus upon? And this can be as large as your ultimate career hope or uh, a really tiny challenge. And uh, just as we walk through these tips, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the example of making these slides 508 compliant. So first, I had to set that goal, right? I had to ask, OK, I'm creating these slides. How do I ensure that they meet, they meet you know, accessibility requirements? Um, next thing, assess how your current network is supporting those goals. And this is where you want to have that network visualization, right? Um, so you can actually see this. Uh, you can see the people on there, and you can figure out where those domains of expertise are that will help you reach that goal. Um, personally, I am not a 508 expert, um, but fortunately, I know someone who is. And that leads you to your next piece here, and that's determine, you know, if you don't have that person in your network, determine what's missing, right? Um, you'll probably find some gaps. Um, in, in my example, I was fortunate not to have that gap, but that's only because I had a similar challenge as this. Uh, about a year ago or two years ago, um, and I actually had to make the effort then to identify someone uh, with those relevant skills, and because of that, they're now in my network, so I can reach out to them when I have a question about this. Uh, number four, identify those people who can bridge those gaps, right? Um, in this case, it was a co that colleague whom I'd worked with previously. Um, and then for the last two here, um, we've talked about this idea of reciprocity. Uh, it's not just about what they can do for you, right? Think about what you can actually do for them as well, right? And you can. Um, so keep thinking about that, and that's going to keep you away from that sort of icky mindset of, oh, gosh, I'm asking someone for something, and I'm not giving them anything in return, because you probably are. Um, in my case, not only did we spend maybe 15 minutes looking at slides, but 
We actually had a great conversation. We were able to connect on a couple different ideas over the course of our discussion. Uh, we shared some of the projects and the challenges that we were working on, and, and we found actually found a couple areas of, of potential future collaboration. And that leads to the last point here, and that's just be curious and be open uh, to where these new relationships uh, might lead. So I know we're a couple of days past May the 4th, but I will close out just by uh, by saying, you know, there really is this, there really is a network force, you know, um, it exists. Um, and it will proactively guide you down a path. So you do have to be intentional um, about which sub-networks and which people you add into your network. Now, as you become more aware of those network effects, you can start to see, really see the dialogue between you and your network. You know, there's a push and a pull, and you'll start to see it everywhere. It's kind of like that, um, that scene in The Matrix where Neo can suddenly see the computer code running through everything. Um, and, you know, the chaos of the world kind of diminishes a little bit, and it becomes a little bit more understandable, um, a little bit more predictable um, in, in understanding why things are the way they are and why they sometimes why they stay that way. Hopefully it's also going to give you insights as to where you can push to change things that, that should be changed, um, not just about you, but about your work group, uh, about your agency, about your community, um, and, and about the world that, that we all share. Um, so your key messages here overall, um, both from an organizational and an interpersonal lens, right? Visualize your networks. That's the first one. You got to be able to see them, to use them, to, to uh, not just use them, but to, to grow them too, to cultivate them, right? Um, you really need to confront some of your mental models to be aware of your biases and your preconceptions too, right? Because you're only going to be as effective as, as you can be if you see those holes, right? Um, we talked a lot about that need to be strategic and intentional, right? You know, if we leave our networks unattended, they won't be able to achieve that, that full potential. Okay. And finally, again, you know, prioritize those collaborative demands uh, and maintain that focus on quality over quantity. That's going to serve you every time. Uh, so as I mentioned, a couple of resources. Uh, they're in the slides here. They're going to be shared with you. I highly encourage you to check them out. They're all super cool. Um, if you're really interested in network science, Specifically, um, I'd point you to the first book on the list there, um, and then also the documentary, which is available free on YouTube, uh, The Power of Sixty Years, which is, which is a really cool, um, about a 45-minute um, read. And uh, I'd love to take some questions if we have some time, although it looks like we're actually right at the end, aren't we, Kim? I think we have time for one question. I'll be sending the questions uh, to Dylan, and I'll email it to the um, the listserv and, and the folks who attended today. So, so don't worry if you didn't get your question answered. Uh, Siobhan, do you want to pick out one question? Sure. Um, let me let me find one here. Is there a resource that you recommend to learn to be an enterprise contributor? Mm. Definitely check out Gartner, um, or, or it was the, the CEB, Corporate Executive Board, but um, they have some really great resources. Um, if you don't have access to their full database for your organization, because it, it is a paid service, um, there are a couple free resources online if you just do a search for it. Um, I think there's a couple, like a quick video on, on YouTube or Vimeo on on what the concept of an enterprise contributor is. But ultimately what you really want to do is, is you want to be someone who can see the sort of strategic connection between your role, your function, your technical special specialization, and the mission of your organization. You, want to, you really want to be able to connect those together. And if you can do that, and if you can do it well, um, and you can also do that while connecting to others within your organization, um, and, and you'll, you'll be able to sort of increase that value exponentially. Um, but it's a cool concept, and I definitely encourage you to, to check it out. A quick Google search will, will, will do, you, do you good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dylan. And if you could go back to the discussion question slide, and if you just want to ask oh, yeah. one of those discussion questions to the group. Yeah, so I would ask, um, I'm, I'd ask the first one, you know, um, how aware are you of your networks, um, and how effective are you at managing some of the factors that we talked about, like collaborative, over, collaborative overload, 
um, and, and managing that idea of homophily or closed networks, right? Um, and what are some practices, if you, if you are aware of those, what are some practices that work for you in those areas? And I'd love to hear what they are. And let's hear, hear some, some folks uh, share them with each other here. And I also, while, while folks are typing in, I'd, I'd really love to just thank Kim and Siobhan and Gabby for all the work that goes on to put these sessions together. They, uh, they do a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes uh, that I was not previously aware of. So thank you to, to each of you for, for everything. Thank you, Dylan. Awesome today. Really great job. Thanks. And then I just wanted to have um, one last question. Uh, Siobhan, if you want to choose one more question. Sure. Um, let's see. Is there a, matri a metric that evidence um, that, that shows that open networks are an indicator of better performance over time? Yes, absolutely. Um, I would point you to uh, to Ronald Burt's research at University of Chicago at the Booth School of Business. He uh, has made his life's work uh, studying or not just organizations within uh, networks within organizations, but um, uh, individual effectiveness within your career. Um, again, a, a quick Google search for, for Ronald Bird, and he's, he's referenced in the slides above. Um, if, if you can't find his name or if you forget it, um, will we'll lead you to a, a, just a wealth of academic research that, that he's done. Um, and that, that key piece of that open network, um, is, it really is like one of the top, one of the top elements of effectiveness um, in your, in, within your career. Thank you so much. So I will get uh, the information. So there are a few additional resources that were mentioned uh, both by Dylan and in the chat, and I'll combine those with, uh, with the, the resources that Dylan had already put together and share that with the group. And I'll also share the questions that we didn't have a chance to get around to um, with Dylan so we can get your uh, answers to your questions. But thank you all for attending today, and thank you for uh, having patience with the technical issues. And, and I think it went pretty well for being fully remote for the first time, so it was a bit of a learning experience. But, um, but thank you all for hanging in there. And I will be posting the video recording on the YouTube channel and sending a link. So uh, you will all be getting an email uh, from the registration platform with a survey. So please do fill out the survey. There are a couple questions in there uh, that will get you thinking a little bit more about what you've heard today. And uh, I'd love to see your responses to that. And uh, coming up, we'll have, again, that seminar on resiliency and also on organizational culture. So be on the lookout for those. And everyone, take care and be safe. And uh, thank you again, Dylan. And we're virtually clapping for you. <laughs> Great. You're very welcome. Thanks so much. And thank you, everyone, for, for taking time out of your day. I look forward to connecting in the future. <laughs>